All right, it's time in the Range on Principal class to get to know some individual plants. And we're going to start kind of close to home. Three really big ecosystems that are kind of uh, dominating the um, Great Basin are the sage steppe, the salt desert shrublands, and the intermountain bunch grass. So these are the plants that hopefully if you're up here in the Pacific Northwest, these are the ones that are right out your back door and maybe they'll look familiar. We're going to start there. Okay, the two main ecosystems that we're looking at are this green part, the inner mountain bunch grass, that includes the Palouse and the canyon grasslands and the Camas prairie, other prairies throughout the Great Basin, and then the purple, which is a really big ecosystem, uh, the biggest ecosystem in North America, actually, and that's the sage steppe, and it's dominated by sagebrush with some grasses in between. That's what steppe means. It means grasses in between. Okay, before we get into the plants, let's take a look at some of these ecosystems we're going to talk about. On the left are the shrublands, the sagebrush steppe, which again is those sagebrush plants with grasses in between. And the salt desert shrub there on the bottom looks kind of bland, but it's really important winter habitat for deer, elk, uh, pronghorn, and then also sheep and, and goats. Really, uh, that's an important low-growing shrub for winter forage. We'll talk about that. On the right-hand side are a couple of the iconic uh, grasslands that we think of as the bunch grass, intermountain bunch grass type. The Palouse Prairie, of course, that's what we have right here around Idaho, right here around Moscow, the University of Idaho. And the canyon grasslands are those grasslands that you see all the way through Oregon and Idaho and, that are, and Nevada that are just in those canyons where the land wasn't farmed and it's still grasslands. So let's take a look at some individual plants. These are the plants we're going to cover in this class. Uh, a couple of bunch grasses at the top, again this intermountain bunch grass type, one forb, western yarrow, and then four shrubs. We'll just go through those. I'll tell you a little bit about their ecology and how to learn to identify them. First plant, the most iconic grass of the bunch grass type is blue bunch wheatgrass, right in the name, blue bunch wheatgrass. You can see it's a bunch grass. It's not super strong. The stems are not right up against each other. They kind of flare out, but it's definitely a bunch grass. Uh, the leaves, another distinctive thing is the leaves on it go all the way up the stem so that there's even leaves sort of intermixed with some of the flowers at the very top of the plant, the inflorescence at the top of the plant. You can't always see it on a picture, but the nodes are purple, and that's a very important identifying characteristic when you're out in the field. So try to take a look at that picture. If you think it's blue bunch wheatgrass, try to look for those purple knees. It's got those nodes, the kind of purple or blue knees. Now it's called blue bunch wheatgrass, and if you look at these pictures, it doesn't look very blue. But when the plant is young, it does actually have a blue sheen to it. Then it grows older and it gets quite green, and then it turns kind of that um, tawny straw color. It is a wheatgrass, and all wheatgrasses have spike-type seed heads. So here's a closer look at that spike-type seed head. Um, on the right-hand side, you can see that the, the, the um, spikelets, that's what has those awns coming off. So one spikelet is there, and then another spikelet is, starts just above it. Just as one spikelet ends, the next spikelet, spikelet begins. So you have this really overlapping point where one spikelet ends and another one begins. That is a characteristic of this grass, and it's very different than the next grass, so that not overlapping characteristic. It does have awns. Within each of those spikelets, there's several florets, several um, little florets, and each of those florets has an awn on it that curves out when it gets mature. When it's young, they're straight up, and then they curve out as it matures. So to, to know this plant, look for a bunch grass, with leaves that go quite a ways up the stem, and then look for spikelets that are not overlapping and that have awns. And at maturity, those awns curve out. Those are the main characteristics to remember blue bunch wheatgrass, which is an important perennial native plant. Okay, here's another perennial grass. This one is introduced. This is crested wheatgrass. It's closely related to blue bunch wheatgrass. It is a wheatgrass. It does have a spike type seed head, but it's a little bit different. Two major differences. One, if you look at the leaves, they're mostly on the lower half of the plant. They don't go all the way up into the seed heads. So look for that, and then look at those seed heads. The, the inflorescence has spikelets that are strongly overlapping. I'll show you some more pictures of that. So look for a strong bunch grass, but this time leaves are mostly on the lower half of the plant. And now let's take a closer look at that seed head. There it is. See how those spike those inflorescence is full of spikelets that are just strongly overlapping 
So when one when one starts the when one starts the other one starts right above it. So just look for just that strongly overlapping characteristic, which gives it almost a comb-like characteristic. So that's the main thing to look for. Look at uh, spikelets that really overlap. One starts right above the next. It does not have strong ons. It has kind of on tips, but unlike blue bunch wheatgrass, it does not have ons. So it is a bunch grass. Its um, in spikelets are strongly overlapping. It does not have strong ons, and it's kind of comb-like. It's perennial, but this one was introduced. It was brought to us from the Russian steppe, uh, which where which is where it originated and then it was that made it really well adapted to the climates of the um of the great basin and so it does really well in the great basin it's not terribly invasive but it just holds down the soil and and kind of keeps the ecosystem intact idaho fescue is another important bunch grass this one is native it has very interesting uh, leaves. It has a, it's a very strong bunch grass. The stems are really closely aligned with each other, not loose like blue bunch wheat grass. They're really strongly aligned and the leaves are really thin. They're just like thread-like, I would describe them. Take a look at the roots too. The roots are distinctive. They're really dark colored. So on the right-hand side, you see those just a few little roots, fibrous roots sticking out that are very black. And then now you'll see on that right hand picture what I mean by having the stems being really, really closely lined. They're really smooshed together as if someone just was pushing or pulling them together. So it's a very, very strong bunch grass. And then those leaves are very thread like. They are almost all originate from the base. They not so much up the stem, mostly from base. And then they just kind of uh, move up like, like threads. They just kind of are in the plant like a bunch of threads. Okay, the inflorescence is also different than the bunch grasses, than the wheat grasses. This is a panicle. The definition of a panicle, again, is a branching branch. So you'll see that the, the, the spikelet will come off of the main stem and it will come off on its own little branch. And often that branch will branch into other branches. So it'll come out and then you might have two or more florets, um, two or more spikelets on one panicle branch. This, uh, these little spikelets have four or six um, inflorescence or little florets in them and each of those florets has an on tip on it it's not a big on but it definitely is an on so again a spikelet is a group of florets and those florets are held together at the base there's a set of glooms and in this case each of those florets has a little on on it now let's take a look at this forb that we have this is a perennial native forb in fact it's really widely spread across most of north america it's certainly well known in the Pacific Northwest in that sagebrush step site. It is about knee high. It's kind of a mid height forb. It has rhizomes. So when you see it out on the range, you'll see that it's not a bunch. It's kind of a sod underneath that plant. There are little runners under the soil, the rhizomes, and they create new plants as they move out. The most distinctive thing about the plant, though, is those highly divided, really fern like leaves. It looks like someone just cut them in, into little pieces and sort of uh, took a leaf and just cut it into little threads. That fern like leaf is distinctive of it. This plant probably is familiar to you um, or next time you see it, take some and, and rub it in your hand and has a really distinctive, very pleasant odor. And that um, is a, it's, it's formed by an essential oil. It's an essential oil that is in the plant. And that essential oil has a very important antibacterial characteristics. A friend of mine said that when she's out in the field, she takes um, some yarrow and because yarrow is really widespread, she rubs it in her hand and that's what she does instead of washing her hands or using um, an, uh, an antibacterial agent. She just rubs that yarrow in her hands because it's a good bacterial agent. I've also seen people use it on cuts to keep a cut when they're out in the field, stuff some of that yarrow in there to keep it from getting infected. From an identification characteristic, a couple of the most important uh, aspects of it, the characters of it, are these white flowers that um, are kind of, uh, they form a, a solid top, almost an umbrella-like top. They're not an umbel, but they, they really do move up with all of those uh, branches to form kind of a, a, an umbel or an umbrella or a flat top. So white flowers forming kind of little flat tops on the plant and then really fern-like leaves. If you see rhizomes, that's a really dead giveaway. So those characteristics are of Western yarrow. It's an important perennial native plant throughout the West. 
Big sagebrush, of course, an iconic plant of the West, that smell of sage and that just the landscapes that are just full of this sagey green color, that's big sagebrush. It is perennial and it's definitely native to Western North America. Uh, it usually grows say two to three feet, but there are some varieties of sagebrush that are lower and there's some that are taller. So two to three feet is kind of um, that mid range. There are three different subspecies of big sage. There's Wyoming big sage, Basin Big Sage and Mountain Big Sage. And some can be very tall and some are much shorter. The distinctive thing that all three varieties of sagebrush have is that three-tipped leaf. The Latin name is tridentata, so it's dent, like dentist, trident, so it's three teeth. So you see that leaf has three little teeth on it. So it looks like kind of a, a piece of pie with three teeth at the end. And that is the one thing that all different big sagebrushes have in common. There are, of course, um, dozens of kinds of sagebrush, but big sagebrush is a unique species. Here's some more characteristics of big sagebrush. And if you look at that picture on the right, the, the first thing that I had noticed is that the leaves are kind of uh, on the base of that plant. Those are all the leaves that you see off of those stems. And then off of that, there's these small branches that come up and the branches hold the seeds. In that middle picture, that's a picture of the seeds. They are totally not showy. They're a little bit yellow in this case, but they're nothing that you would uh, you know, pick and call, oh, what a beautiful flower, it's just there. They're very small flowers and very small seeds, and they're held on those branches that are way above the, the leaves of the plant. So the, the, the little seeds and, uh, and flowers are kind of on little candles above the plant. So they're these little branches that um, extend above the leaves of the plant. So from identifying characteristic, look for that three-tip leaf, sage color. It's called big sage. There are other kinds of sage. There's little sage, sand sage. This one's big sage. It's perennial native. It's got those small indistinct flowers that come up on branches above the leaves. Deerbrush is an interesting plant. Take a look at that leaf. It's a big ovate or elliptic leaf. It has an entire margin, so it's not dissected at all. And it looks like something that would be just a great mouthful for a deer. And it is, and that's where it gets the name deer brush, because it really is good forage for those browsing wildlife. It, they can just get a full bite of this really soft and uh, nutritious leaf. So when you look at this leaf, take a look at that just nice bite of green and that, that and remember that that is deer brush. Of course, it's a perennial because all shrubs are perennial and this one is native and it has a, a kind of long stems and it forms really dense mats. Uh, again, the leaf is elliptic, and another interesting thing about that leaf is look at the three main veins that we have. They, there's three kind of branches that come off, and they're united at the base. That's really unusual. So the, these plant, these leaves alternate up the stem, and then each of those leaves has three main veins. It's a characteristic of this family, the Ramnaceae, but it's pretty unusual among plants. So that's a dead giveaway. Another characteristic of this plant are the very um, interesting and pretty flowers it has. They are from white or pink to purple on the plant, and they, they come up at the very end of the stems in kind of little like bottle brushes, kind of little fuzzy brushes at the top of the plant. It has a raceme type seed head so that each of those flowers has one little branch that connects it to the main stem, and that's why it gets that kind of bottle brush look. Again, looking at those leaves, large elliptic, reminding you that a deer could take a good bite of that, and that's a deer brush. The stems are also pretty pliable. They kind of come up in nice at nice kind of curves. Again, that would be a good bite for a deer, and those flowers. There's their beautiful smell. Sometimes they'll just stop you dead in your tracks when you're out in the range. Very sweet, and they're good for pollinators, and of course good for um, browsing animals. Now shad scale is something we'd see down lower in the elevation. We'd see it down in the salt where the salt gets into those basins in the Great Basin. And so salt accumulates there and then uh, the, the plants that grow there are well adapted to salt and salt brushes are those uh, plants that are adapted to salt. This particular salt brush is called shad scale salt brush because the leaf is like a fish scale. It's kind of obovate, a little wider at the top than at the base. And sometimes you'll even see salt. If you taste these leaves, you'll, you'll taste the salt. The way that this plant deals with the salt is it, it um, absorbs the salt, brings it, and deposits it on the leaf. So that's where it gets that salty um, flavor, that salty look, and that's where it gets its name. 
Also notice that the branches on this left hand picture, you can see it pretty well. The branches um, just end in kind of a sharp tip. And if you look at that, you might say, well, that can't be very good to eat. So why is it considered a good forage? Well, what happens is in the winter, those leaves stay on the plant. Largely, they kind of ha hang on the stems and then the stems get really brittle. After um, it freezes, those stems just get brittle. So in the winter, um, pronghorn, uh, deer, elk, sheep can really use this as an important forage because it keeps those leaves and those those spiny stems are no longer spiny. They're brittle. They break off when the animal eats them. So this is an important plant of the Great Basin and it's an important winter forage. Here, this might give you a little better look at those shad scales. See that they're a little bit um, wider at the tip or uh, at the mid range and they kind of look like uh, scales of a fish. Not sure who gave it its name, but when they saw this plant, they thought it looked like a plant that had a lot of scales hanging on it. So shad scale, salt brush. I'm not going to say anything about the flower. It's so indistinct. You can just hardly see it. You need a microscope to really look at what that flower looks like. It has not does not have a showy flower or a showy seed. It's very indistinct. This is an important perennial. Again, it's a shrub, so all shrubs are perennial and it is native to the Great Basin. Shad scale salt brush. Okay, the last plant in our list is winter fat. And winter fat is an important plant because it lives up to its name. The, it has very fleshy leaves that stay on into the winter and animals can eat that in the winter. Those stems are mostly herbaceous and those leaves are nice and plump and it, it makes animals fat. It's really good, it's important winter forage. Uh, it's perennial native, it's pretty low growing, I've never, I seldom see it knee high. It's usually kind of a little above your ankle, pretty low growing. Another way to remember the name is the leaves are real woolly. Its Latin name is actually Lenata, which Lenata means woolly, like wool from a sheep. And you can see that that picture on the left, it looks kind of indistinct or kind of fuzzy. That's because it's a woolly leaf. So that will help you remember woolly for winter and fat. And we talked about enrolled leaves when we described uh, plant characteristics and you can see that this plant on the left has an enrolled leaf that means that the margins roll back under towards the underside of the leaf so that's enrolled another interesting characteristic of this plant that is this is uh, described on the right hand picture is that it has a woody base and yet those stems that come up are herbaceous so it's more like a forb above and a woody plant below and, and many people call this a half shrub it's woody at the base and it's um, herbaceous above. The scientific term would be suffrutescent. So this is a suffrutescent plant or a half shrub, woody at the base, forb-like or herbaceous above. The flower is also not very distinct, although it does have kind of pretty orange anthers that hang out once in a while. So you, you will see the flower. It's these little kind of balls that are real hairy and white. So again, if you look at that seed head and you see that fuzzy, hairy seed at the top of the plant, way up at the top of the stem, that might remind you just again of kind of a woolly collar or a woolly sweater that reminds you that name, winter fat. Uh, it has little, lots of white hairs throughout, especially in that uh, seed head, in that little ball of seeds that it keeps at the ends of the stems. So it's perennial native, important winter forage. Those stems are really nutritious it keeps its nutrition well into the winter so it does make animals fat in the winter so those are just a few plants that you might see in the sage steppe grasslands you might see some of the salt desert shrublands and some of these you would see in the intermountain bunch grass type